Good morning, Calvary. Welcome this morning as God's people gather to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just a reminder, if you're new here today or within the last few weeks and we don't know who you are yet, we have a Connect desk out there that's staffed before and after the service. And there is a QR code out there on a little sign at both doors. You can scan that with your phone. It'll bring up a visitor form so that we can get your contact information. We'd encourage you to do that. And if you want to know more about our church, there's also a church center app that you can download and connect to Calvary Baptist Eau Claire and it'll give you all the information and you can do all your online giving and get all the announcements and everything right through that church center app. Would you stand with me please? Reading from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and the heaven. Hosanna to the name of the Lord. Us. 
Amen. Would you give a, a, just a shout of praise, a hand clap, something to praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. It's my privilege to share with you a few of the ministry opportunities that exist here at Calvary right now. And one of them is that uh, we're in the middle of Operation Christmas Child. That's what all the boxes are out there in front of the church offices to help uh, pack those with gifts that become a gospel presentation to children all over the world. And our youth group is going to be specifically packing boxes on November 13th. So if you have items that you can donate to pack those boxes with, there's a list of suggested items on the youth room door, and there's a box outside the youth room. You can put those items in there, and uh, let's see how many boxes our youth group can pack on that day. Kids Link volunteers. Our growing children's ministry needs volunteers to serve at the registration desk and in Discover Link, which takes place for our children during this worship service. If you'd like to serve once a month in helping to teach those children, we would love to have you get involved. You can use the Church Center app to sign up or talk to our children's ministry director, Amanda Koppel. And then coming up on Saturday, November 6th, will be a, uh, a, a soup luncheon for all children's ministry volunteers. It'll be a time to celebrate your service and for us to thank you for that and then to connect with other volunteers and also to receive some additional training for our children's ministry. So mark that on your calendars for November 6th. Immediately after this service today, after we go offline, we're going to ask you to stay for an extra 10 to 15 minutes as we have some missionaries here who are going to present to us what their mission work is, but it can't go out broadcast. It's just for our congregation. So just be aware of that change in the service schedule for today. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, uh, we have an opportunity today and every day to honor you with the first fruits of our lives, whether it be the first fruit of our energy, of our time, of our skills, our abilities, and our resources. May you constantly receive our best because you gave your best for us. Thank you, Jesus, for the gifts of financial resources that will, will be received today through one of the various ways people can give. And we pray that they will give generously and cheerfully as an act of worship to you. In your name I pray, amen. It's always wonderful to have missionaries back at Calvary that we have supported for many years. And uh, we have today the opportunity to have uh, Travis and Paula Barton and their children that are with us and Travis is going to come right now and he's going to share just a few thoughts to whet your appetite for what he's going to talk about at the end of the service today. Travis, welcome. Well, it's, uh, it's, thank you. It's good, it's good to be back. I, I, uh, you know, sometimes you, you I think of an hourglass and all the sand running through it, and you want to just slow it down a little bit and stop it, but there's no way you can. There's just no way. And, uh, but I, I appreciate uh, Calvary. You guys have been our, our home church. Um, you know, we had a beautiful time this morning sharing. And, and what's really burned on my heart is, is the, need, the need for the gospel to continue to move out is paramount. And, 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 and maybe sometimes people get tired of missionaries coming. Like, oh, well, they want money. Oh, well, they're, uh, I, I got lunch. It, 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 Jesus, Jesus said this. He said, at a time when the disciples were struggling with Jesus going to the cross, going away, he says, well, I have to go. This is my paraphrasing. He says, I have to go. I'm going back to the Father, and because I do this, there's going to be greater works done. It's the salvation of man. 
In, in ministry over the years, you, Calvary's been with us since day one. And, and I remember our, our first month in the field, we, we dealt with a ransom situation. We were in Mexico. One of the churches was hit by, by a drug organization. Pastor Chaya was beaten, and, and two members were taken. And, and God began to strip out this idea of what I had of what ministry is. And, and it's easy for us to get ideas of what ministry is or should be. But yet there comes a time when you have just this whispering of the Spirit and, and we proclaim what he says from the rooftop. And, and we've seen incredible things by God's hand over the last 10 years and, and, and we have some additional things and doors God has opened into some extremely depraved realms that, that we, we have a heart to share with you following service. And so unfortunately it cannot be broadcast um, but I do encourage you that it not be an inconvenience, but, but stay and hear what our God is doing, as well as I, I, I beg you to join us in prayer over the things that we will be sharing following service as well. Uh, we are, just as far as what we can share publicly, uh, my family and I, we have, we have been in ministry for roughly 10 years. We, we are in Mexico five years on the border, uh, for around three years and maybe more, I forget. And, and then recently we've begun an, a, an effort here in Wisconsin of Hispanic ministry. And so this last year we've been about the work of, of meeting a, a lot of Hispanics that are coming into the area. Uh, we're, we're working on some church plants. We have one in Cumberland. We have some farms and stuff through Spring Valley and, and some surrounding areas. M many of you know the 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 things that are happening on the southern border. And so right now, the overview of our ministry is, is, is very much Hispanic ministry, Hispanic population. We've learned some, some, some sad things in regards to a lot of this population and the abuses and, and the human trafficking and things that are taking place. Um, so we, we look forward to sharing more details here uh, following the end of the service. We encourage you to stay um, if you're not able, just uh, remember us in your prayers. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you much. Thank you, Travis. Let's pray. Father, God, what a joy it is in my heart to realize that uh, from within this body, you raised up Travis and Paula to be your servants wherever you have chosen for them to go. You have trained and equipped them for the ministry that is yet ahead of them, and we thank you that we have the privilege today to be encouraged in our own faith by the stories that we will hear from them yet today. Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you will continue to equip them and bless them and empower them so that they will be a part of the soon overflowing harvest of souls that is to come. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.
My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name
be seated as we continue to worship through prayer. Um, we just have a couple of prayer requests and then I'm going to ask you to do something. Um, so the first prayer request is I don't have all the details, but there's, um, you know, the situation in Haiti where those missionaries were um, uh, confiscated or kidnapped and I think there's 17 of them. I was trying to get myself looking pretty so I didn't get all the details and so, um, but we know the Lord knows all of it, and we can pray on to him for their safety and for their protection, um, and that those that have done the crime will be able to uh, see the love of Jesus through them. Um, and then also we can just pray for the search team. They're meeting right after the service here over lunch um, for their first meeting to see about the associate pastor. We just pray that they'll have a unity, that they'll have um, clear direction, and that the Holy Spirit will um, just guide them in their decision-making process. And um, I want to have a little time for us to pray um, together. And so if you, I could be so bold as to ask um, you to not just look to the person to your right, because if everyone did that, you wouldn't be able to see anyone, but they're back. But just kind of maybe a family group next to you and ask how can you can pray for them right now. And then we'll have some time to pray for these requests, and then I'll close this in a word of prayer.
Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. We thank you that there is nothing that surprises you, Lord. And even in the situations in our lives and in around the world that we see and we maybe wonder at what is going on, you are still in control. And Lord, we just pray now that as we continue to learn from your word and as we, I just pray that these things that are happening in the circumstances of our life do not distract us from what you have prepared for us uh, through your servant, Josh. We just pray all these things in your precious and holy name, Lord. Amen. It's a delight to have you here this morning, and I am excited about continuing in our Philippians study. So if you forgot that we were in Philippians, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2 right now. Today we're going to be talking about working out. I thought I'd hear some groans. There you go. Thanks. Thanks. We're going to talk about how to have joy from working out. Do you know that's biblical? I know, right? I may be using it as a play on words. We'll find out. But really, when you think about working out, at least when I think about working out, when you picture people working out, you don't necessarily see their faces filled with joy. You see their faces filled with strain. There's usually like a reluctancy, right? And so they just strain their face and you see the opposite of joy. Unless you're part of that small group of freakish people. (laughs) I mean that in the most loving way. Who love to work out. Who get what I've heard is this thing called like a runner's high, right? I've never run enough to get one and I don't care to. Um... (laughs) Maybe someday I'll have to. But some of you know what I'm talking about, and you're not freaks, okay? But some of you get delighted in working out from that that runner's high. It's invigorating. And I think what what I see is happening is that you are so focused on the benefit that you have laid aside those selfish desires of wanting to just eat and lounge, and you have put on this idea of working hard for a goal, and you're actually working out this healthy person that's inside of you. What I mean by that is if you've ever watched the TV show The Biggest Loser, it's a collection of of heavy set people who come so that they can transform their lives and their bodies. But usually it involves this overly motivated physical trainer, right? who shouts at them and pushes them. And usually one of the things that this trainer yells at them is, there's a skinny person in there somewhere, let him out, right? Well, Paul is doing the same thing here in Philippians, but doing it without insulting their weight. He is saying, somewhere inside of you is Jesus Christ, let him out. And that's what we're going to be studying. So have that thought process as we read Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. We honor God's word and do so in your heart, but if you're able to do so by standing as we read it, please stand. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now... Not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation." among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. You may be seated. 
So what we're going to see here is, yes, it is a play on words, as you caught. Paul is talking about working out your salvation, but we're going to have some comparisons to actual physical working out. But the one thing that I want you to start thinking is I want you to see what the foundation is for working out that Paul gives us. He actually gives us three things as a foundation of working out. And the very first one that he gives us is in one simple word that starts this passage, the word therefore. We see that the proper foundation is having the proper mindset. It means that we need to set our eyes forward on the things that are coming, but we need to have a foundation to do that. So in verse 12, that first word, therefore, this points us to what is the foundation. Last week, we talked about that foundation. Remember the description of Jesus, how he came down in all humility. And one day, then he was exalted to the highest of places. That's the foundation that Paul is now building on as he talks about working out. So because of what we learned, because of the example that Christ set, and how I too can live a life that is worthy of the gospel, for the glory of God, and since Christ was exalted, I too will follow him, and I will also be exalted because of that. Therefore, that's our foundation. So with this future glory in mind, I want to do this in the present. What Paul is going to say is the this. With the future glory in mind, do this. That's what's coming in Paul's description. So that's our foundation. To help illustrate that, I have a friend who recently ran a half marathon, Dan Cope. And um, I thought that this was a good comparison in what Paul is trying to do, to have our eyes and our minds set on that future glory as our foundation. So Dan had to properly train. He did a lot of running. He did a lot of um, eating healthier, getting his stamina built up for this half marathon. So he did proper training. From that training, he was able to set goals, not just realistic goals, but goals to push himself. So he had proper goals in mind so that when the day came and you asked him what he wanted to do, he knew, I want to do it in this amount of time. It was his goal. He had a proper training schedule. He had goals in mind. And his mind was set on the finish line. Had he run that race with his mind set on every step and every bead of sweat and every sore muscle and every runner that was either passing him or he was passing, he would not have finished as well and he may not have finished at all. But because as he was running and enduring all of that, working out with his mind on the end and the glory that it would feel when he got to cross that finish line, it made running that race easier. It made the training worth it because he had his eyes on that proper mindset, that future glory. That's what Paul is saying, the foundation of what he's telling the Philippians here. Therefore, because Christ did it and you will be exalted one day as well, that is your proper mindset. Paul also addresses that we need to have the proper ability So he's telling the Philippians, this is what you need to do, but you need to know and be able to do it. And look at verse 13. Now, if you're trying to follow along exact verse by verse, this passage is not going to do that. There's a lot of things that are interconnected. So from verse 12, we draw lines and circle things in verse 13 because they connect and we're kind of all over. So if you're wondering why I went from 12 to 13, and then I'm going to go back to 12 in a minute. That's why, because things are all connecting in this passage. So, verse 13, we see the proper ability comes from God himself. He's not telling the Philippians to do it on their own. He's saying, based on that foundation, this is what I want you to do, and you can do it because God is the one working in you. Verse 13, for God, for it is God who works in you. It's not us working for our salvation. This is not Paul saying this is you earning your salvation. This is the salvation that is inside of us, that free gift from God being worked out among all of us. We can work out what God has already worked in because God is the one who makes it possible. And then he continues with another reason or another indication of where our ability comes from. It is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. The Amplified Bible puts it this way, for it is not your strength, 
but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. This is not a task that is unachievable. For us left to ourselves, yes. But Paul is saying, you're going to do this and you're going to be able to because it is God himself who is working in you. Don't work for your salvation. Let the salvation of Jesus Christ work itself out because it's God who gives you the ability. So we have the proper mindset. We have the proper ability. And now we see Paul back in verse 12 Give us the proper understanding. What does it mean to work out your salvation? Well, we know that it's motivated by that word therefore on the foundation. The ability comes from Christ at work in us. And it must be your own workout. It must be your own salvation. You cannot go to a gym and work out someone else's workout. That's not how you do that. You can't watch someone work out and suddenly it's going to be effective for your life. That's not how that works. It's the same in our walk with Christ. It must be your own. You can't have someone else's salvation for yourself. It must be your own. You have to understand that you need a savior. A lot of times our outlook is this direction and we go, wow, all of those people need Jesus and we forget sometimes That one, we need a savior. And then if we already have that savior of Jesus, we forget that we need to let it be working out. And so you have to have your own commitment to Christ. This is that part of a parent where you go, oh man, I'm on my knees in prayer because someday I pray that my children will own their own salvation that they will stop thinking that just the proximity to a Christian family or being around people in church, I'll be fine. That's a lie. You will not be fine. It has to be your own workout, your own salvation. So kids, if you hear me, please, Jesus Christ as your savior is the most important thing and it has to be your own. You can't work out what Christ has worked into someone else. Don't confuse that. Jesus Christ alone is salvation. There's not many ways. But when you find Christ as your Savior, you are uniquely created to express that joy in a way that God has equipped you to express it. Which means when Miss Amanda accepts Christ as her Savior, when that happened, she suddenly went, I want to minister to children And some of you are like, oh, I don't want anything to do with children. Great. When you express the joy of your salvation, for ministry's sake, it could be in your workplace. It could be as a pastor. It could be wherever the Lord has you. That's how you uniquely express the joy of your salvation. Don't copy someone else's workout. If you're not called the children's ministry, then get out of children's ministry. We need all of you to be uniquely inspired by the salvation that is in you of Jesus Christ working itself out for his glory. Paul moves on by telling us what the attitude of our workout should be. In verse 12, he says that your workout should be with fear and trembling. Now that word fear brings with it two ideas. It brings with it the idea of fleeing because you feel inadequate. I'm going to run away. I'm inadequate. I'm going to run. I flee. But it also brings with it this idea of reverence and respect for God. So if you put both of those together, it means that you understand that God, Almighty God, is fully powerful and fully adequate, and you are not. Not even a hint powerful. Not even a hint adequate on your own. And he demands awe and reverence. So before an almighty God, I say that he is God and I am not. And I stand in awe of who he is, not in awe of who I am. But then Paul continues and he uses that word trembling. Trembling is directly attached to that word fear. It even means shaking as a result of fear. It can also mean one who understands their inability to, to meet all requirements You're starting to see how this pieces together. 
He is God, I am not. He is able, I am not. He has to work out that salvation in me because I can't do it on my own. And so what it produces, that attitude, is reverence for God. It produces even a trembling that God himself would call me, that he would send Jesus Christ to die for my sins and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he would indwell me, this empty vessel, so that I can work out his salvation, my salvation for his glory. It should produce awe, fear. It should produce some trembling, not because you're worried that God is going to smack you dead, but because he is all-powerful. And what reverence there is that I tremble before an almighty God. That's what Paul is saying, the attitude of our workout, that fear and trembling. But then he continues, I think it's easy to have fear and trembling before an almighty God. Do you know what's not easy? The next part, verse 14. Your attitude of your workout should be without grumbling and complaining or disputing. I do not believe that this is a church of grumbling. I do not believe that you have a spirit of evil or complaining about everything, but let's be really honest. Every single one of us grumbles more than we should for people who are lost sinners saved by Christ. And so Paul knows that. The Bible addresses this many times because we don't struggle with showing joy too much. We struggle with complaining and gossiping and disputing with people. And so another reminder says, if you are truly saved by Christ and you're gonna let that work out, do it without grumbling or disputing. You see, when I work, well, never mind. When I think about working out, I think about grumbling and complaining. And you know what happens? If I were to work out, it lives up to that exact attitude. I grumble and complain about it, it's going to be a terrible time. But if I were to think about the benefits that it has, if I were to change my perspective, just like Paul said at the very beginning, I have my eyes on that future glory built on the foundation that we saw earlier in chapter 2, And I would realize that in the midst of everything, I can glorify God, even in a real-life workout. It's going to live up to that attitude. It's going to glorify God. I can never be disappointed if my focus is Christ being proclaimed. And that's what Paul is saying. Do it without grumbling. Do it without disputing. See, when you are complaining and arguing, you drive the crowd away from you. When you're grateful and you're gracious, you draw them in. And we see later on in verse 15, we're told to shine as lights. So we know that we're supposed to be different from the dark world that we live in. We're supposed to stick out as a shining light. That light is going to draw some people in. Not every person, but it will draw some people in. We can't leave the world in darkness. Bad things happen in the dark. Being in the dark without a shining light can lead to some tough consequences. You see, back in the days before electricity, there was a frugal old farmer who was yelling at his farmhand for wasting fuel by carrying a lantern with him every time he went to visit a particular girl. The farmer said, you know, back in my day when I went courting, I never carried one of them things. I always went in the dark. To which the farmhand replied, yes, and look what you got. (laughs) Being in the dark without a shining light can have its consequences. But in the spiritual world, it's not funny. The world is dark and it needs Jesus. And without a shining light of Jesus and the truth of who the Savior is, it's eternal separation from God. So when you're working out the work of Christ inside of you, you aren't complaining and you're not grumbling because you're too busy rejoicing that he is being glorified. Paul repeatedly teaches about joy in all circumstances because, like I said earlier, we're inclined to grumble in most circumstances. So it sounds oversimplified, but let's be real. If you are grumbling and complaining while doing God's work, then you're not doing God's work God's way. 
We need to be open to feeling that conviction. Am I serving the Lord, but every time I come, I grumble and complain, then you're not serving the Lord the way he instructed. We need to fine-tune our faith so that we're open to saying, yeah, that grumbling is a sin, and I need to rejoice. Jesus fine-tuned people's faith around him, and he was rejected for it. You think of Matthew 5 when he says this, you have heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you that whoever looks upon a woman with lust has already committed adultery. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your neighbors and pray for those who persecute you. Unless they have a different political view, then grumble. Unless they treat you poorly, then complain. No. Jesus fine-tuned the faith of the people around him. And a lot of people hated him for it. But are we open to changing our grumbling and our complaining and rejoicing because of the workout that we get from God himself giving us the ability to work it out? So that's the attitude that Paul addresses here in this passage. And as he continues, he gives us the impact of working out. Verse 15, he says, be blameless and innocent. Wow, what a lofty thing to say to a bunch of people who are inadequate and have no ability, right? But God himself is working it out in us, right? So being blameless and innocent isn't unachievable when we have God doing it. Blameless in this, in this uh, context means a moral purity. It's not a ritual purity. It's from God working in you to will and to work. It's not that external purity that we can just put on. It is worked out from the heart of Christ in you. 1 Samuel 16 tells us that man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so we cannot earn salvation because that would be just an outward decoration to this empty vessel. Salvation comes from the heart belief and the confession of your mouth, and then it works itself out in our actions to the people around us. So be blameless. But then he continues with that word innocent or harmless maybe in your translation. That word means unmixed or unmingled, not a destructive mixture because it's not tainted by sinful motives. So what that means is that our lives are supposed to be unmingled or pure and genuine. Really what it means is, is Christ your master or not? Unmingled, unmixed, not serving two ma masters. Matthew 6 tells us that when it comes to money, you can't serve two masters. You can't have both God that you're serving and money. And we know that that applies broader than just money because in 2 Corinthians, we see that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has been put to death. Behold the new creation. We cannot serve God and serve our dead selves or keep reviving our dead self. We serve God as a new creation. And so we are not mixed. We are unmingled and pure. That's that word blameless or innocent or harmless. Paul desires the Philippians to be genuine. We should be blameless from the inside, not from appearance. This sounds difficult, but it's actually quite a relief. You don't have to be two different people. Every one of us struggles with changing who we are in context. And it's exhausting. You can be who God created you to be because he's working itself out. Trust him. Stop putting on a face. Stop doing things differently in different contexts and just be a light in the world. Some people will think you're weird. I've had a lifetime of people thinking that. It's awesome. Be weird. Be a shining light. You're supposed to stand out. And that's what Paul continues. He says, shine as lights. It doesn't say that some of you are going to shine. It declares that every believer in Jesus Christ will shine. The question is, how brightly are you shining? How do we shine as lights when our grumbling and disputing matches that of a dark world? We walk amongst the world and we blend right in because our light is so dim that no one notices. And I believe a lot of times it comes from that grumbling and disputing. And Paul warns of this. Remember, he's writing to the Philippians, you know, in that 
city of Philippi, where it's an extension of Rome. And so residents of Philippi were Roman citizens. And Paul has already warned them to live as citizens of heaven, not as citizens of Rome. He has told them, stand firm, stand out in the crowd, be a shining light, and you can't do that if your attitude matches the crowd. The impact of working out with the proper attitude and the proper foundation is that you will shine as a light in this crooked world. And that's what we need. So what is the result of working out? Paul closes in chapter or in verses 17 and 18 here in this passage. And he gives us two results from working out. We all are wondering, what is the result, right? We got that picture taped to the mirror of that guy with a six-pack, right? And we're like, what is the result going to be of my workout? If anyone needs a picture, I'll give you one. (laughs) I'm just kidding. The result of working out, Paul gives us two. There are many, but in this passage, he gives us two. The first one is the possibility of persecution and death. Wow, way to motivate us for a workout, right? One possibility is you could die. Look at what he says in verse 17. Even if I am poured out as a drink offering. Symbolically, one translation says it's the outpouring of one's lifeblood in service and suffering for God. But we have scripture to help us identify what that drink offering means. And you know what's really cool? Our youth group right now is going through a uh, grueling study on Leviticus. What are the concepts from Leviticus that even as adults, some of us have said, I'm avoiding Leviticus. Well, Pastor Evan and the youth have tackled Leviticus and they're looking for all of that law and how those principles apply to today in our lives. And you know what's great? If you don't know what a drink offering is and you're like, what is Paul even talking about? You turn back to Leviticus and we'll discover what he means by that. So we need things like Leviticus to help us understand what Paul is saying in the New Testament. You see that drink offering? This is what it means. When there was a sacrifice offered to God, it was put on the altar and then the fire beneath it created an aroma that rose to the heavens. You know that a sacrifice was an animal, and so a burning animal creates not a great aroma, right? Here's where a drink offering can come in. It was very common to pour oil or fragrance or wine on that sacrifice to make the aroma pleasing to God. It was all about what can I do to honor and glorify and please Almighty God, and so that was one of the applications of a drink offering. You also know that a fire is hot and when you pour liquid on it, steam and a mist is created. So symbolically or figuratively, Paul is showing that the end is near. The sacrifice, death, could be close for him. Remember, he's waiting trial to see what's going to happen to him. His death is close. But he desired that his service would be pleasing to God. It would be a drink offering, creating an aroma that went to the heavens and it would be pleasing to God. His life being poured out as a drink offering has value and it's meaningful and it's used by God, but it is only there not to distract from the main sacrifice. That main sacrifice is Christ. And Paul said, I live my life in service for Christ and even my death, I don't want to be a distraction. I want it to be pleasing to God as a drink offering. So Paul shines as a light and takes joy in that fact alone. You could reject him, kill him, persecute him, and it's all a victory in his mind because you can't change his shining light, which means the result is always joy which is the second result of working out. So it's not just persecution and death. The result of working out your salvation is always joy. This is what he says. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. So even though death is near and practical, Paul rejoices as he has brought glory to God. His working out has produced a stronger faith in the Philippians, and it has brought glory to God in countless ways. And so he rejoices. He gets his joy from working out because working out has resulted in being a sacrifice for Jesus Christ, either by life or by death. 
His desire for the Philippians is is to have the same mindset. Serve Jesus. Give him your life. Turn over your selfishness. Allow him to work out what he has worked in and the circumstances of life won't seem to matter because the result is always the same. You're a sacrifice for Jesus Christ and he will always be glorified. There's a story of a man who ended up in prison for doing the Lord's work. But before he would even get to prison, he was attacked by a mob and a crowd of people. They ripped his clothes, they beat him with thick branches, and they weren't careful as to where they hit him, even blows to the head. To further humiliate him, they put his feet in the stocks and they put him in a cold, dark cell. He was a prisoner because he was being a light. But even then, while he was in his cell, he trusted God for who God is, and he was even able to express joy. He even sang songs of praise loud enough for the other prisoners to hear him, as if he wasn't rejected enough, right? And then he's in prison, and he decides to sing songs of praise, further separating himself from the crowd. While he was in the prison, though, there was even an opportunity put right in front of him to escape. Oh, some of us even, in this easy opportunity to escape, would have considered it. We would have justified it probably and said, well, this is the Lord's way of dealing with injustice. But not him. You see, in that time, he stayed put because he knew other people needed to hear about Jesus. He even observed a guard who was blaming himself for this opportunity to escape, and the guard put a knife to himself and this person stopped him. And eventually, that shining light from this person brought this guard to Jesus. And then his whole family to Jesus. It wasn't a result of this person being a great and impressive person. It wasn't a result of this person grumbling and disputing, and suddenly someone was one to Jesus because of how much they complained. No, it was because this person allowed the working out of their salvation They were in reverence to God, knowing that there is no greater joy than glorifying God with their life or even with their death. That full story can be found in Acts chapter 16 because it's Paul's first visit to Philippi with an earthquake that allowed him the opportunity to escape. But he couldn't help but working out his salvation and knowing that it's for the glory of God that he stays and wins souls who are lost. Paul was later released and he was able to see the salvation from his shining light. Some of us may not. We may be working out and it's grueling and we're not seeing results, but we have to trust that even though we're working out our salvation and it's tough, we trust that God is the one who is working it in you. He worked your salvation in you. He will strengthen you. He will give you the ability to work it out. And we can always rejoice in that because our efforts are not in vain. Someday, We will be with him and we will see as he sees. And you will see the results of the working out of your salvation, even though it is grueling. Will you pray? Father, perhaps the most difficult realization today is having to confront our own attitudes. We gather in your name and it is incomparable right now to be part of a body that glorifies you in worship and in song and in studying your word. And there is no place that I would rather be right now except with you in glory. But I thank you for the people of this church. I thank you that we, as a body here, are not defined by grumbling and complaining, but it would be naive of us to think that we have arrived. And so I pray for all of those areas that we need fine-tuning, that as we work out our faith, we allow you 
to give us the ability and the wisdom on the areas that we need your strength. I thank you that we can have the foundation of what's to come, the future glory with you. And that is our motivation right now. I pray that as we go from this place later on today, that we would be thinking about rejoicing all the time because we can never have our salvation taken away from us. We can never have that future glory canceled or ripped away. It is secure and in that we can rejoice as we work out. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of the Savior, the hope of nation. Yeah, yeah.
Zephaniah 3.17, it says this, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. Through the power of Jesus Christ, you've been given salvation. Rejoice as that salvation is worked out among you. You may be seated.